Time seems to pass slowly along this particular stretch of the Missouri. The river floats by and the sound is soft, like distant rain, as thousands of acre feet slip relentlessly downstream. Looking out across the river here, it appears to be an ageless, timeless thing, a perpetual slow motion watercolor that is oblivious to everything around it, indifferent to anything but its own persistent energy. Under the water's surface, the realm of the river seems even more removed, more disconnected from life on the land. And it's easy to imagine that the river could somehow be so removed that it might be immune to the world it runs through. But it's not. For centuries, Native Americans undoubtedly enjoyed views similar to this of the river that they dubbed Big Muddy. Countless animal and bird species have drawn sustenance from the river's ecosystem. And a wide variety of fish species have called this river home. In fact, from the end of the last ice age until the middle of the 20th century, the Missouri flowed wild. At alternate extremes, a raging bull or a lazy liquid serpent, a dominant force in the landscape whose impact on life changed dramatically from season to season, often in sudden and violent ways. But up here on the spillway of Big Bend Dam on the Crow Creek Indian Reservation in South Dakota, it's apparent that the river no longer flows untamed through the Missouri Basin. As a result of six main stem dams, the river today is managed with a flow rate that is designed, engineered, and built in. Its movements are no longer made at the whim of nature, but it flows with a steady purpose and regularity. The Missouri is harnessed to produce hydropower and to store water resources behind dams that determine the water's rate of migration downstream. Millions of people benefit in countless ways from the hydroelectricity produced by the river. And in addition, the huge reservoirs created behind the dams provide vital water resources that are dependable and able to sustain life even in the times of drought. But the ecosystem today is different. The Missouri has been dredged, changing much of the main channel's historical character. Instead of exhibiting a natural variety of shallow and deeper zones, the main channel is maintained to a more standardized depth to accommodate the needs of navigation and barge traffic. Altering the river with dams and dredging the channel has had a dramatic effect on vital signs in the Big Muddy. Consequently, changes made to the river ecosystem have significantly affected at least one species, a species that has long been a resident of these waters. The pallid sturgeon is a fish that is native to the Missouri River. In fact, this particular species has been part of the environment so long, its ancestors were alive when dinosaurs inhabited the earth. Now this is a remarkable legacy of life for a species to survive even the dramatic climatic changes that drove the mighty dinosaurs out of existence. However, in just the last century, this uniquely majestic fish with millions of years of life history has been forced ever closer to its own extinction. In addition to changes brought on by dams and dredging, overfishing has taken a heavy toll on the slow growing and late maturing pallid sturgeon. Between the 1890s and 1940, commercial catch records for river and lake sturgeon ran as high as 430,000 pounds annually. Prized for caviar, the pallid was taken along with other species of sturgeon with little regard for its life cycle or ability to recover from the devastation of over-harvesting. 
changes to the river's ecosystem and overfishing have taken a dramatic toll. So today, it's estimated that there are just 350 to 500 adult individuals in the reservoir reaches and 1,000 to 4,000 in the channel reaches of the Missouri River. The pallid sturgeon is a bottom-dwelling fish that thrives in turbid, slow-moving water. In the oxbow and blue hole regions that once characterized the Missouri, the pallid was very much at home. In great numbers, the pallid would swim upstream to the same spawning areas, sites that may have been used for literally thousands of years prior to the 20th century. But once its numbers were depleted by commercial fishing, the pallid was vulnerable. As the dams were built and the channel was dredged out, many of these spawning sites were destroyed or became inaccessible, putting the pallid on a collision course with a decidedly undesirable destiny. The pallid sturgeon evolved in a, in a natural Missouri River that was diverse with depths and sandbars. It had vegetated sandbars in the middle of the river and, and unvegetated sandbars in the middle of the river. And the channel was spread throughout the floodplain. Often in that scenario, it's, uh, the, sh the river would be too shallow to, to move barges. So in an effort to facilitate navigation, the, the channel was dredged deeper, which drew the water into a deeper, narrower channel. The sandbars have been removed. The shallow water areas are no longer there which was once a diverse river is now um, channelized to support the, the barge traffic. But while changes in spawning sites and the channel environment have had significant impact on the species, these factors are only part of the problem affecting pallid sturgeon survival today. Pallid sturgeon can live to an age of 40 years or more. A long lifespan does help the species survive, but it also means that each fish takes longer to reach full maturity. Consequently, female pallid sturgeon don't begin to spawn until they reach the age of 15. And even mature fish do not spawn every year. With the low numbers of adult pallid sturgeon left in the Missouri Basin, it's no surprise that spawning success today is limited. But the big picture may be even more bleak, as a recent U.S. Fish and Wildlife study estimates that pallid in the reservoir reaches are not reproducing. As if the threats mounted by physical changes in the pallid's environment were not enough, an even more ominous problem has surfaced to challenge the pallid sturgeon's survival. Recent tests indicate that contaminants in the water, including PCBs and DDT, may be severely impacting the fish. These chemicals reach the river in the form of runoff from agricultural and industrial sites. And tissue samples taken from native fish indicate levels of PCBs, DDT, and other contaminants are alarmingly high. Vital organ tissues contain significant amount of pollutants, and these substances appear to be having a profound effect on the reproductive ability of the pallid sturgeon. What we're finding is that they're picking up these contaminants. That means the contaminants are out there in the environment. We also saw what happened with the bald eagle uh, and how, how the, the, the population plummeted uh, because of the uh, um, contaminant chemical impacts. We're seeing some chemical impacts now, contaminant impacts on the pallid sturgeon. And what we can, we can extrapolate, that, that tells us the chemicals are out there. We know that the chemicals are bad to, to the natural environment, and we can speculate that they are bad for the human environment. We have um, studies that have been conducted that show that contaminants out there, these pesticides, do impact humans in their development as they are fetus and they are developing that these chemicals are negatively impacting humans and uh, so we're seeing the chemicals in the fish and we're saying well they're out there they can also now be impacting us as well but fortunately 
The news on the pallet sturgeon is not all bad. Thanks to a partnership between federal, state, and local organizations, today there is new hope for saving this ancient survivor of America's heartland. Concerned scientists and environmentalists from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife, the Western Area Power Administration, the Bureau of Reclamation, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, and a variety of state and local agencies have combined forces to form an Upper Basin Pallid Sturgeon Work Group. This work group is dedicated to the mitigation of problems facing the species by studying the pallid and implementing actions in concert with the National Pallid Sturgeon Recovery Plan to give the fish a fighting chance at recovery. The prime object is to find ways for the pallid to repopulate these native waters and eventually return to numbers that are healthy and self-sustaining. There is a national pallid sturgeon recovery team that directs and identifies recovery reactions for the species across its entire range from Montana all the way down to Louisiana. To better focus on the specific needs of geographic areas, work groups were organized um, in the upper basin, the middle basin, and the lower basin to address the needs of that area. And up here in Montana, North Dakota, and South Dakota, the Pallet Sturgeon Upper Basin Recovery Work Group was organized to address issues specific to this area. And that work group is made up um, of a diverse background of, of individuals as well as from the agencies they might work with. Western Area Power Administration is a key player in the work group. The Bureau of Reclamation is a key player. Army Corps of Engineers, the State Game and Fish Departments, the Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, has, the work group has representation from universities who do much of the research. So all these agencies pool their knowledge, um, their financial resources, and their, their staff resources to direct efforts toward the high priority needs within the geographic area that, that they're working within. The Western Area Power Administration serves as a support partner central to this effort providing resources and key personnel for essential activities and tactics being undertaken to save this majestic fish. Western transmits and markets hydropower from the main stem dams on the Missouri, and as a manager of resources in the public trust, Western feels responsible to take an activist role in the remediation efforts. Information is gathered from pallid sturgeon found in the Upper Missouri and Yellowstone rivers to monitor the ongoing condition of the species. One tactic is to temporarily take fish from the river and examine them for physical and life cycle characteristics before returning them to the water. Certain fish taken in this way are also fitted with monitoring devices which allow researchers to track migratory movements and identify individuals that have been previously examined. Recovery team members can then use this information to help guide the efforts of the team and commit resources where they are most effective in saving the pallid. The primary goal is to employ tactics which will help the pallid sturgeon recover as native wild fish. But short term, the team is establishing broodstock in hatcheries to initiate reproduction and begin recovery of fish numbers lost through the inability to reproduce in the wild. There are shovel no sturgeon in the same area that there are pallets, and, and uh, up to this point in time, nobody's been able to differentiate between the two uh, species in the fried stage. We don't know if they're for sure if they're natural reproduction. We do know that there are developing females who have eggs that potentially could spawn given the proper habitat. Of course, the long-term goal of the Upper Basin Pallid Sturgeon Work Group is to restore functions of the large river ecosystem, which is critically important to self-sustaining populations of the pallid. The fish is best adapted to life on the bottom in the swift waters of large, turbid, free-flowing river waters. And it appears that the flowing reaches of the Yellowstone and the Upper Missouri Rivers above Fort Peck Dam may be among the best places to attempt to influence natural recovery. 
The Yellowstone and Upper Missouri Rivers above Fort Peck represent one of the last remaining major river runs without dams upstream. This ecosystem most closely replicates the natural river environment in which the pallid sturgeon once thrived. And it probably holds the greatest potential for recovery in numbers necessary for the species to survive. Other areas downstream have also been identified as the least degraded through efforts brought on by changes in the river. Combined, all these areas hold the greatest hope of successful natural remediation, in part because of their habitat diversity, which includes sandbars, side channels, and water depth variations more hospitable to the pallid sturgeon. Right now, the Upper Basin Pallet Sturgeon Recovery Work Group is targeting the Missouri River above Fort Peck Reservoir and the Yellowstone River as high priority recovery areas and potential areas for reintroduction of, of hatchery fish because these areas are the least altered of much of the other pallet sturgeons range in the, in the upper part of the basin. Um, above Fort Peck Reservoir you don't have the effects of the main stem dams that are downstream the Missouri River and the Yellowstone River is one of the nat largest natural flowing unaltered rivers left in the country. So you have much of the natural functions and environment in the Yellowstone River that would provide what's required for these fish to survive. So we're looking at these areas as our priority reintroduction areas. One important aspect of pallid sturgeon remediation is raising public awareness of the fish and its struggle to survive. North and South Dakota have established regulations to protect against the incidental killing of pallid sturgeon by requiring the release of all sturgeon caught within their borders. In addition, the states of Montana and Kansas do not allow commercial harvest of any sturgeon. However, other states within the Missouri and Mississippi valleys do allow commercial fishing for sturgeon. The Pallet Sturgeon Recovery Plan recommends that these operations be closed, at least temporarily, so the impact of commercial fishing can be more accurately assessed. A moratorium period would allow the recovery team to measure the impact of commercial fishing on recovery efforts and give the group data necessary to develop a long-term recommendation for managing activities which affect the endangered pallid sturgeon. Naturally, stabilizing the wild population is a tall order, whose biggest challenge may be to reverse the effects of pollution on the pallid's environment. A wide range of contamination sources, including farming operations, feedlots, sewage treatment plants, landfills, and industrial operations contribute to the degradation of habitat in the river. The effects of pollution sources upon pallid habitat are deadly serious, but at this point in time, they may be difficult to control and hard to reverse in returning the river to its more natural composition. But no matter what the ultimate resolution of the pollution issue, pollutants may have already taken a major toll on the species. The hope is that the potentially disastrous effects are not also affecting the human population. Whenever any general environmental threat becomes significant, it often becomes evident first in bottom feeding fish, like the pallid sturgeon. These animals survive mostly on large quantities of insect larvae and small fish found near the bottom of the river. Along the bottom is also where heavy metal pollutants such as cadmium and mercury accumulate. Contaminants of this nature in concentration along the riverbed can find their way into the food chain. These chemicals were, were banned 15 and 20 years ago and yet we're still seeing them in the fish today. And that is, that is uh, one of the, the uh, problems with those type of chemicals is that they biomagnify and they bioaccumulate in the environment and they last a long time. The pallid sturgeon is a truly remarkable species 
one that has survived through the ages in the Missouri River. But today, this majestic survivor teeters on the brink of extinction. The recovery team's plan is well conceived and well planned, but it will take many years of dedicated work to effect the changes called for in the plan with eventual delisting of the species not projected before the year 2040. This ambitious project is truly a team effort and the careful collaboration of talented professionals working against the clock and some formidable obstacles. However, with sufficient support, cooperation and understanding between public, private, and customer groups, the pallid sturgeon's survival can be achieved. And once achieved, preserving the pallid sturgeon will re result in benefits, not only to this great fish, but to the vital waterway known as Big Muddy. And ultimately, the greatest benefit will be to the people of the Missouri Basin who use and depend on it. Now remember, only the job supervisor who received the clearance action can release the clearance action. However, in an emergency or if the job supervisor holding the action is not available, his immediate supervisor can assume responsibility for the clearance, including its release. As in placing the clearance, the specific switching steps to return Estes 462 to service are given to the switchman by the operations supervisor. The switching instructions are recorded on a switching program form which is clearly labeled the switching for removal portion. As in placing the clearance, all switching instructions, no matter how simple, must be recorded in exactly the same sequence as given by the operations supervisor. All entries on the switching program form should be in permanent marking material. After receiving and recording the instructions, the switchman must read them back to the operation supervisor slowly and clearly to verify that each switching step has been received and accurately recorded. No switching steps will be performed until the operation supervisor has verified that all items of the written instructions are recorded properly and are clearly understood. The switchman must always complete each step in the sequence listed on the switching program form. If there are any questions about the completeness or correctness of the switching program, or if the switchman does not clearly understand the instructions, these questions are to be resolved before the switching sequence is started or continued. If at any point during the switching sequence, an unexpected relay or breaker operation occurs, or 
If a device is found in a position other than indicated by the dispatcher when the instructions were given, the switchman shall contact the dispatch center. The switchman does not proceed with the switching instructions until directed. The switchman now initiates the switching instructions as directed by the dispatcher. This will complete all switching steps for the removal portion of the switching program to remove the protection and return Estes 462 to normal service. After completing the steps in the switching program to return the circuit breaker to service and documenting the steps on the switching program form, he calls the dispatcher and reports the times to be recorded on the dispatcher's switching program form. After the clearance is released and removal operations are completed, an entry is required in the substation logbook to document completion of the removal portion of the clearance. The switchman records the date, time, the type of action, assigned number for the action, the individual who released the action, and the equipment covered by the action. If an error occurs in the logbook entry, a single line is drawn through the entry and the deletion is initialed. All logbook entries are made in permanent marking material. The name of the individual making the entry must also be entered in the logbook. The completed switching program form can now be placed in the inactive section of the station switching program log. To assist each employee engaged in power system operations, maintenance, and construction, Chapter 1 of Western's Power Operations Manual should be reviewed on a routine basis. These procedures for establishing and removing a safe clearance were developed in accordance with Western standards for switching procedures. Through the understanding of these procedures, in-depth knowledge of the power system, and close attention to all details of performing each step, equipment clearances can be safely accomplished without the fear of an accident or disruption of service to Western's customers.